Hey, Lakeview family, uh, just real quick before we get into the Word, I just want to pray over us and, and just enter into to whatever God has for us. Um, this is a new experience, a new season, and so we're all being stretched in different ways. And so uh, let's just pray before we get started and, and dive into the Word. God, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would come and invade every single household, God, every single car, every person that's just scrolling through and jumping on, God, that you would capture them, that you would arrest their heart, not for our glory or for our viewership, God, but for your glory and for, and, and for life change, God. And we pray that the Holy Spirit, God, would begin to, to fill them from the bottom of their feet to the top of their head, that they would be compelled to give their life to you, God. We pray for every uh, elderly person that is at home, God, that you would subside all their fears, God, that you would touch their bodies, God, that they would be healed in Jesus' name. God, we pray that that you would be with uh, young families, God, that are watching with their children, God, that they would have insight and guidance on how to minister to their children effectively and to have the right answers to tell them when, when they're asked tough questions, God. And, and so, Lord, we're just asking for, for your presence to seal that this is your word and to uh, just to change us. God, let us never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. It's a different season that we're in. It's a, it's a trying time, and, uh, but we're embracing it. We are positive about the future. We are positive about what God is doing. Uh, I've been asked how I'm getting through or how I'm getting by during this season. And uh, Justin got me this stretchy man that I've just been really stretching. And so uh, it's supposed to be some kind of a stress, stress reliever, but it says boss on it, which would be great if I wasn't the boss. So, but, but I feel like maybe this is what God is doing to us in this season. He's, he's stretching us out of joint. He's doing something uh, unique and, and new in our lives. And so, so we're all kind of getting this stretch. But what's cool about being stretched is it means that I can hold more after that stretching process. And so I want to encourage you at this time to embrace the stretch, embrace the stretch that God is putting uh, on us all. Uh, another thing that we're uh, doing that's really kind of makes you feel better anyway is the, um, the old hand sanitizer uh, squeeze. Uh, that's isn't that funny how something so silly makes you feel like you're ready to just tackle the world now? Um, but that's been something. So keep your hands washed. Keep up on those things. Uh, but so that's just a couple little things that we're doing lighthearted that's kind of passing the time here as we're focusing on on how to enter into the season as a church. But, but I want to tell you about uh, something so much more glorious than that today. We're going to be looking at Psalm chapter 91, and I want you to, to track along with us. Psalm 91, and we're going to read the first 13 verses. Now, I'm going to be reading from the message translation. Um, there's some things that the message translation hits that other translations don't. Uh, there, there's some place that, that the message gets it wrong, but there's a lot of places that the message gets it right and really puts it in vibrant language. And so I just want to hit that uh, right now. Now, something unique about Psalm 91 is that some uh, Hebrew scholars believe that Moses wrote this psalm, and, and there's no uh, nothing to denote that other than just tradition. Uh, he wrote Psalm 90 by tradition, and so they think since there's no author put on uh, 91, that they just kind of combined those two psalms in a sense to say he wrote them both. It would make sense based upon the language and, and, and what is captured there uh, in Psalm 1. And so they believe uh, that it was composed by Moses after building the tabernacle in the desert. So what this psalm is encompassing is, is how it is to leave slavery from Egypt and to enter into the tent and tabernacle and the place where God lives. It's about leaving something old and entering into something new that God has. It's about the experience that Moses would have experienced entering into the tabernacle and being enveloped by the divine cloud of God. Now, what gives us a good illustration of the value of the secret place, because the, the Bible says that he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, this takes me back to, to memories as a kid. If you were a kid and you grew up anywhere 
you probably built a fort or you got a bunch of sheets and quilts and you put chairs in different places and you made a, a tent. You made this place where you could, it was like another world that you were entering into. It was your space. It was a safe place. And, and even though it was in the open and it was rudimentary, uh, you felt like you were hidden. You felt like nobody could find you when you entered into this secret place or, or under this, this dwelling here. And, and you would usually invite your, only your best friends could enter into, like when you had a sleepover or something, and only they could get, you were very choosy about who could come into your space. I remember we were out in the woods one time and then we found a bunch of branches and we literally stacked up uh, different sections of branches to make this kind of dwelling and we felt like we were hidden from the world. And that's kind of the, the language picture here. It's this place that, that we could hide. It's this place that we would be safe. It's this place that's almost magical in a sense that we could drift into and, and we could enter into with God. And what's so great about this psalm is, is that it's not us creating a place. It is God creating a place and then inviting us into that place. Now, so think about this picture that the psalmist is painting. He's saying that God has a secret hiding place and here's the glory and the beauty of it is that you're invited to enter into sacred space with God and not just visit, the Bible says, to dwell there, to live in the place to where God has set up for himself that you might have engagement and communion with him. I want you to think about this hiding place now, if Moses wrote this psalm, as tradition might suggest, think about the awesomeness of what Moses is talking about, what he would have experienced. You can remember the time where Moses declares to God, show me your glory. And when he says this, God says, there's no way you can see my glory. It's too glorious. But what I can do is I can put you into the cleft of a rock and you can see my hind parts. You can see a part of me, but you're not going to be able to look at me face to face. And so, so we see something unique here. This is a picture here of Jesus, right? Because Jesus, the Bible tells us, is the rock that followed the children of Israel. And he He's the one that went with them this entire time. So God, in a sense, is sticking Moses in a safe place to where he can engage God and begin to look engage on God. Now, as cool as the thing is that Moses experienced, the Bible tells us that Moses experienced pales in comparison to the relationship that we now have in Christ, that Christ has brought us so near that we can actually enter into what Moses saw a shadow of, we can enter into the reality of and be in that uh, forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. So we have more than Moses had. So when I read this psalm, I want you to know that this is not less of a truth because we tend to think, oh, wow, the children of Israel saw great miracles. They had it way better. Uh, the reality is, is that was just a type of what God was going to do in the New Testament and in the age to come. So we have actually more to enter into. More of this applies to us now. More of this psalm actually comes to fruition in Christ and so when I read this, don't think it's less than Moses' experience. I need you to track with me and understand that Psalm 91 is actually more of an experience, more of a beautiful thing that we are able to engage right now. The promise is that we can dwell where God is in the secret place. Matthew chapter 6 Jesus says that when you go to pray, go into secret. He's not necessarily talking about a, a specific location. He's talking about entering into a place where you and God have unique fellowship. That is communion on the deepest level. So I don't want you to get caught up in a specific place, but I, I want you to see that the secret place has now extended into us being that reality. And wherever we're at, we can enter into a secret place of God's protection. All right, so let's look at this. Psalm 91, verse 1. Again, we're reading in the message. 
You who sit down in the high God's presence, spend the night in Shaddai's shadow. Now, this is what I like about that because they're keeping true to the Hebrew here. Most of the time, El Shaddai is translated Lord Almighty or, or Powerful Lord. Now, Shaddai is believed to be from an Akkadian root word, Shadu, which means mountain. So this can be translated the God of the mountain. And anytime God is meeting with people, when he met with Moses, and what it was all about coming to a mountain. So the mountain was like this picture, a physical picture of what the people of God could look at and get this understanding of God. So when we think about a mountain, we think about a safe place, something unmovable, something unshakable, something that we can build a cave in and be protected, something that we could hide from a storm. We get all these kind of figurative pictures when, when we hear that, that God is the God of a mountain. But it's also a word picture here, and I'm not trying to get too graphic, I'm just giving you something in the language language of the day. It is also the Hebrew word uh, that gives a picture of breast. Now, what this would mean would be a nurturing as a kid that is, is nurtured by their mother. And so it's not just a place of strength, a place of safety, a place of provision, a place that, that we can run into and be safe. It's also this place of nurture. It's also this place of healing. And, and so it gives us this idea, the shadow of a mountain is not only strong, but it brings us into this place of provision and protection and nurturing where we're not just safe outwardly, but inwardly we're being made into something better than what we would have otherwise. This is the image of God. When God wanted to show his image, he made man and he made woman so that both sides of his nature could be shown and the intimacy of those two would then make a child. And this child would be nurtured not just by man, strength, provision, uh, protection, but would also be nurtured by woman, which is loving and nurturing and teaching and caring and involved. And so that these two realities are present in God. So when we enter into the shelter of the Most High, we're not just entering into some kind of stale protection that doesn't care about us. We're entering into a protection that is all in concerning every single part of our life when we enter into the shadow. Now, when we enter into the shadow, this is a picture of a tent. It's a picture of the tabernacle of God, the place where God dwelt. And so when we are invited in, we're invited into God's special place, God's tent. The Bible goes on to say that, say this, God, you're my refuge. I trust in you and I'm safe. That's right. He rescues you from hidden traps, shields you from deadly hazards. His huge outstretched arms protect you. Under them, you're perfectly safe. So we're told we're invited into the shadow of the Almighty, into the El Shaddai. But now we're being defined, it's being defined out what it means to be in the shadow of El Shaddai. His huge arms protect you. Under them, you're perfectly safe. His arms fend off all harm. Fear nothing, not wild wolves in the night, not flying arrows in the day, not disease that prowls through darkness, not disaster that erupts at high noon. Even though others that come all around drop like flies right and left, no harm will even graze you. You'll stand untouched. Watch it all from a distance. Watch the wicked turn into corpses. Yes, God's your refuge. The high God, your very own home. Evil can't get close to you. Harm can't get through the door. He ordered his angels to guard you wherever you go. And if you stumble, they'll catch you. Their job is to keep you from falling. You'll walk unharmed among lions and snakes and kick young lions and serpents from the path. So did you notice that there? That life inside the tent carried on to life when you left the tent. 
right? Like snakes and lions aren't in the tent with you. That's when you go out. So when you enter into this relationship and enter into this tent, suddenly every facet of life is suddenly entered into in a new perspective, a new dimension, a new realm in which you are walking in something that God wants you to know that there are angels about you, there's protection about you, and nothing happens to you save the sovereign hand and plan of God. So how do we get into this tent? Right? Like, I want in there. Jesus, I want to be in this secret place with you. How do we enter into this safe place from the troubles around us? Now, remember, this psalm was written by Moses after they had built the tabernacle. So where had they just come from, right? They had come from Egypt from slavery. Right? So after the Ten Commandments, The first thing that God enters into is what it is to be free, truly. So I want you to look at this with me. He gives instructions in Exodus 21, right after Exodus 20 where the Ten Commandments are mentioned. He gives instructions in how to make a regular slave into a bond slave. I want you to read this with me. Exodus 21, verses 2 through 6. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh shall go out free for nothing. For if he comes in single, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons and daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out alone. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go free. Then his master shall bring him to God And he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall be his slave forever. So right after this dramatic exodus from slavery, God tells them the first thing you need to know about slaves is they go free. They go free. You're not entering into the same practices of the world. And you know how they go free? They go free for free. They go free for nothing. That the Hebrew people should not be indefinitely slaved, but offered a chance to go free after a limited time of service. After that, if that person by their own choice decides this is the place to be, then they have that choice to stay there. Now, Deuteronomy 15, which is kind of a five-fifths of the law, it's a reiteration of the first four books of the Bible, goes on to reiterate this. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 12. If your brother, a Hebrew man or woman is sold to you, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh year you shall let him go free. And when you let him go free from you, you shall not let him go empty-handed. You shall furnish him liberally out of your flock, out of your threshing floor, out of your wine press, and the Lord God that has blessed you and what he's blessed you with, you shall give to him. Verse 15, you shall remember that you You were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this today. But if he says to you, I will not go out from you because he loves you and your household, since he is well off with you, then you shall take an all and you shall put it to his ear into the door, and he shall be your slave forever. And to your female slaves, you shall do the same. So God's MO is people go free. The only time you're entering into this kind of bond is by choice. 
Now, this is showing a great picture that I'm going to paint out to you later of what's done in Christ. But I want you to think about this. The master was so good that he can't think of being on his own because to be on his own or her own would be worse than being under the care, the provision, and the tent of this master. I can guarantee you that this did not happen very much in the ancient world, that people probably took their freedom and left. This would be a very rare case, and this rare case would be only when they came under the tent or the shadow of a master so good would they by choice hand their life over to that master. So why a piercing? Why a door? Why an ear? This is kind of a strange story in Scripture, but but I want you to, to get this picture. It's a really weird ceremony. But just like anything with the Bible, when something's weird, if you scratch below the surface, there's lots of meaning there. So I want you to take these principles first. Nails driven through flesh, blood on door frames, a permanent piercing with holes and scars forever. Does this sound familiar to you? Right? Like they had just left Egypt... And to leave Egypt and to have uh, the death angel pass over them, right? There was a sacrifice. There was blood on doorposts. And this allowed this, this Passover to begin to occur where they could walk freely, not under a plague or a curse, but under this divine uh, protection. And so here in this ceremony, we're seeing the same thing. We're seeing a piercing, a sacrifice. We're seeing blood applied to... uh, uh, a doorpost. And so there's a lot of parallels here. So, so let's just tackle them as we go. Why piercing? Uh, this process was for the slave by the reason of love that it told us that wished to serve the master voluntarily. And he would be taken to a door frame. Uh, the awl was something that bore a hole or, or, or some kind of a spike or, or a nail potentially. It was something used to make a hole through the skin of the earlobe, making this mark permanent. Now, if we remember something that Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, if you, you might remember this, that it says, I carry the scars of Jesus on my own body. Okay? So he carries the scars of Jesus on his own body. Here he's using the same language. The Greek word there would be uh, stigma, uh, where we get the word stigmata. But this isn't some weird Catholic thing where the sores of Jesus start appearing in weird places. And it's nothing like that. He's using this as figurative language. He's saying, I've found a master so great that I had the choice to walk away when he offered me uh, what it would be to come into relationship with him. But I've so entered into the tent and to the secret place abiding with this man that I know how good his heart is. And for me to be free would be worse than to be under his shadow, under his tent, and to be under his care. So he's using this language that the ancient uh, readers would have looked back into and they would have said, oh wow, he's talking about this moment where by the sake of love, the sake of choice, someone could put themselves in a position to put themselves to the doorpost of their master's house and allow a spike to be drove through them as a stamp to say, I am theirs forever. This is a a beautiful thing that is happening here. It's a a mark, pricked or branded upon the body to say, I am this forever person's property by love and by choice. Paul is talking about scars here. He's talking about lasting impressions that show ownership. John chapter 20 verses 19 through 20, Jesus shows up and and the disciples are scared and Thomas has been doubting. But he shows up, and what does he say to to show them that he is who he is? He shows them their scars. See, they 
saw the piercing to the cross as a curse, as a, as a dream killer, as a breaker. But what was actually happening is Jesus is being nailed to the tent of God's presence. He's being pierced to say, I'm the one that is God's property by choice and by love, and I'm his only begotten son. And if any man believes in me, they shall enter into this place of eternal life, a place to dwell with God forever. And so the cross looked like this place of punishment, but it was this place of God showing that this is my way into a uh, eternal relationship with me, which brings us to our next thing. Why a door? Why the doorpost? So we here we see this image of Jesus on this doorpost in a sense, because Jesus says in John 10, I am the door. He's saying, I am the entry point to get into the shadow of the place of the Most High. I am the way to get into this place. And so when he was pierced, he was showing, I'm God's son. And not only was he showing, I'm God's son, he's saying, I'm the doorway. I'm the portal from slavery to enter into this place of love and freedom and relationship. You can leave this portal of being a slave to sin and you can enter into this new dynamic dynamic, this new portal, this place of new life, of new dimensions, a place of relationship, a place of strength and protection, and not only that, a place of nurture where you are taken care of and honored by God Almighty himself. Jesus said, truly I say to you, I'm the door of the sheep. And again, he says, I'm the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and he will go in and out and find pasture. So when we think of door frames in the Bible, our mind is brought back to the Exodus story itself, the most pivotal moment in Israel's history, the moment where the Israelites were liberated from forced slavery and were delivered into freedom. They were willingly entered into a covenant with their God to follow His commandments. The blood on the door front frame is one of the most iconic images of this transfer from slavery to a new master by a love relationship and freedom. The blood of the Messiah from his pierced flesh on the cross, the blood of the Passover lamb on the doorpost, the blood of a slave who for love agrees to serve his master willingly. Remember what Jesus said, not my will be done, but your will be done. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, I'm the father's property and I'll allow myself to be pierced to the doorpost, which is myself, the door of entering into relationship. So what is the significance of the years? Well, we find that earlobes also feature in two other significant places. And I just want to read to you one of them for sake of time. Leviticus chapter 14. The Bible says that in verse 14, the priest shall take some of the blood of the guilt offering and the priest shall put it on the lobe of his right ear who is to be cleansed in the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right ear foot. So we have priests made holy that would serve unto the Lord by blood being applied to their ear, their thumb, and their foot. The blood on their foot would indicate their walk, that they would walk upright and holy. The blood on their hands is, is a picture of their deeds, that their interactions and their actions would be of noble. And the blood on their ear would be the Shema. Hear, O Israel, listen. That there's not a word for listen and obey in the Hebrew language. That listen means obey and obey means listen. Like there's not even an idea that I would hear and not obey. Like that's already been solved. I've already entered into covenant. So here we see the blood applied to the ear of a priest to make their ear holy where their whole duty is just to listen and obey. When the Apostle Paul uh, begins to write every, almost every single letter he writes, he addresses it at the first as this, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus. Now the Greek word for bondservant would be doulos, which means 
slave. So how is Paul introducing himself to every church? Paul, a slave of Christ. In other words, I've tried every other master. I've sought refuge in the learning of Judaism. I've sought all these things. I've even been free myself and had a time to where I could be my own boss. But what I've found is that there's one master in whom I bear the marks in my own body that would indicate ownership. And I'm better off being under his care, under his tent, and by love and freedom of choice coming into relationship with him. I'm better there than anywhere else. So when he has the authority to write to these churches to give them directives and to give them insight. The reason he has this is because he's already handed the ownership of his own life over to God and his life is not worse for it. His life is the better for it. See, we are free. We are completely free to choose. But do you love the Lord so much that you would go to the doorway of decision, which is Jesus Christ? Would you go to the doorway of decision and would you put your ear to the gospel and listen and obey? Say, God, I'm yours. The Bible says if the slave plainly says, I love my master, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him to God. And that's where the covenant is made. You see, it's like when Peter is confronted in John 6 by Jesus himself. And Jesus is talking about the necessity of who he must be in life. And he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, and he's talking figuratively, unless I become your life source, you can't even be in relationship with God or me. And everybody walks away offended and puzzled. and like, well, Who does he think he is? He can't say this. And then Jesus turns to his disciples and says, do you want to go too? And Peter says, Jesus, where else can we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. Peter was saying is, is, Jesus, I've already put my ear to the doorpost. I've had my choice to walk away and choose my own life and my own freedom. And I've found life with you to be so awesome and so beautiful and so right that I'm entering into relationship with you. And I'm saying, I will not go free because I love you too much to leave you. See, your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when you are in Christ, you are in his tent, under his shadow. Like a kid, you are in his fort, under the wings of his protection, and nothing can truly hurt you because you are in the mountain of God, safe and nurtured under his arm. See, Jesus was nailed to the cross to be God's son forevermore. And by his blood, we've been brought near. That in Christ, we never have to leave God's tent again. You can choose to stay with God forever. You know, during this season, I've been getting so many messages from past relationships from high school and other things and people being tuned in because of our frequency and, and more people getting online. I, I, I've been reached out to relationships that I haven't seen in 20 years because of this medium of ministry. And they're interacting and they're asking questions about the Lord. And so maybe this time is about something completely different than what we think it is. Maybe this is our opportunity in a scared world to say, I'm under the tent of the Almighty and there's room for you to come under here with me. Maybe this season, you need to get out from being exposed by masters that don't really love you, 
the people that are using and manipulating you that could care less about you. And you come into a new master called Jesus. And you put your ear to the gospel, which is, I love you. I died for you. If you'll put your faith in me and not yourself, I'll take you. I'll protect you. I'll nurture you. See, what I've found is, is that we're all slaves to something. Paul says you're a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. That no man is truly free. He's either driven by his desires or driven by the Spirit of God. So I want to tell you, time to quit running. Time to quit playing games with God. It's time for you to enter into relationship with Him and have an encounter and be saved. And when you enter into that relationship, these will be your words. God, you are the kindest, strongest, and most able Savior I've ever experienced. And God, you are so, so good. Would you pray with me? Lord, I pray that anybody here, God, that is in the place of decision, it's time that they put their ear to the cross and say, I'll trust and obey. It's time that we give ownership from Satan of our life and our sin issues and we give them over to you. God, that the burden of sin and, and it would be lifted and God, we would be free to walk in relationship with you, God, that, that you're inviting us not to just come over and visit, but you're saying, you can dwell with me. You can live with me. And so God, we are entering into that relationship now by faith. We are declaring to you, God, that we leave our past behind and we walk into relationship with you. And so Lord, we ask for life change, for a feeling of your sweet Holy Spirit that empowers us to be who we need to be. It's not in our own strength. It's only by yours. So God, bless every home today, God. Bless every person today. And let them be empowered to know that they dwell in the secret place of the Most High. And there's no God higher than you. And we give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. If you need some help or need prayer, you can inbox us at Lakeview Assembly here on the Facebook Live, and you can just go to our messages, and we will pray for you. If you made a decision to follow Christ, let us help you in these weird times, and we'll try to figure out ways to connect. Same thing, you can inbox me, Matt Stevenson, on Facebook, uh, my personal page, or you can inbox um, the Lakeview page as well. But we just want to try to provide every opportunity that we can to help you. May God bless you and keep you, and may his face shine upon you. Look forward to seeing you next time. God bless. I'm